in this time that we live in with all the things that can distract us, there might be, I don't know, 700,000 really great things that you can do today. There's one thing that only you can do. Rhonda, thank you so much for being here. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah, me as well. We share a lot of the same values and and passions as far as um, awakening the light in others and helping others to achieve their purpose. And I'm going to jump right into it. You know, your story is so powerful and touching, but not easy to reflect back on, I'm sure. But I'm going to start there because our childhood shapes so much of who we become, or at least how our journey begins in life. And then, of course, we're responsible for course correction, for healing, for self-reflection, for inner work as we mature. And you were abandoned by your parents at an early age, raised in abuse and put into the system um, before being emancipated, as you put it, at 16. Right. This might not be a question that you've gotten before around that, but what did that experience open up for you? What did it reveal about yourself? Because there's always multiple angles we can look at every situation in life from, right? We have to find the lessons, the opportunity. So what did your early years show you about yourself? Oh, Michael, my goodness. Sit down and buckle up, buttercup, because (laughs) it's a lot. Um, First of all, it's not difficult for me anymore to look back at all that kind of thing. I think that when... um, you know, if we're, if we're doing life right in the pursuit of our purpose, there comes a time when we actually can be, I know this probably sounds crazy to some people, but there's a time uh, in our lives when we can get to the point where we can be really grateful to the people who harmed us. Yeah, We can be grateful for the painful situations in our lives yeah. uh, because we wouldn't be who we are without having gone through those. Because the things that we learn in difficult situations can't be taught in university classrooms. You have to go through, right? So the types of things that I brought out of my experiences of abandonment, abuse, a profound sense of aloneness, the, the unfairness of it all. Yeah. Uh, I could go on and on about the negative side yeah. of it. But what I brought out of it was, for example, uh, from abuse, when I was too little and too vulnerable to do anything about it, uh, that developed in me a burning passion for justice. Mm. It developed in me an empathy for people who have experienced unfair things. And there are lots of unfair things in this life, right? It's not just childhood trauma, although I find childhood trauma uh, to be one of the worst things. Uh, Anytime someone who's vulnerable or fragile is harmed, it's it's just profoundly unfair, right? So, So those kinds of things develop in us an empathy that again, you can't get any other way. You can be sympathetic towards something, but when you've actually been the one who's had your control completely taken away, and experienced the kinds of things that that uh, make you feel less than others or that make you feel shame or humiliation. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the depth of those emotions uh, cannot be overstated really. And those things stay with you, not necessarily in a bad way. What you can mine the lessons out of all of it. That's what I've spent a lifetime doing and then use those lessons for good in the world. That's what I mean by the empathy, the d- the strong burning desire for justice. Um, growing up poor uh, taught me to be resourceful. You know, if, if, you're, if you're only pair of pants rip and you have to go to school or you have to go to work, you learn how to sew, you right. just do, you right. know? Uh, there were times in my life when you know, uh, the car would break down and I had to get to work. Getting to work meant I would be able to eat. And I was really super fond of eating. So, uh, you know, all of a sudden I'm learning how to fix the car. I'm underneath the hood of the car trying to, you know, figure it out. And a lot of things I did figure out that I never thought I would be able to do. So, um, you know, when you have just hardly anything in the house to eat, you have, you know, this much crusty ketchup in the bottle of, of the, uh, j- the bottom of the bottle, and you have a tiny little bit of rice in a bag, you figure out how to make rice and, right. you know, ketchup flavored rice or whatever, but you live, you figure it out. And so doing without whatever it is we're doing without, 
if we can move beyond self pity mm -hmm. and find a workaround, find a way to figure stuff out, we develop a resourcefulness that will serve us later. Right. Um, being alone, being really alone. I mean, screaming for help and nobody shows up alone. Right. right. Taught me independence. It taught me self-reliance, which served me really well when I started my first company and I'm the CEO of the company and there's just no, you know, there aren't, um, you know, little office fairies that are going to show up in the middle of the night and actually get the work done, right? Like, you know, the buck stops with you. Mm -hmm. You need to get it done. If, if it's going to get done at all, you have to get it done when you're first starting your business and you don't have staff and you don't have resources, you don't have money, you don't have family, you don't have safety net. You, you have to be self-reliant. So I could go on and on, Michael, that was a big question you asked because you may even be sorry by now that you asked me that because no. <laughs> I have a lot that I could unpack from, you know, from, from uh, painful events. Something that I'm always thinking about is like pain can be a resource. It can almost be a well of potential. And if we can transmute that potential, we can turn that pain into power and it's just energy, right? And it's almost like this pent up, you know, well or, or reserve of energy that if we can mix those puzzle pieces around in a new way, we can take it and create something great with it. And I think, thank you for sharing that context to say that you have transmuted the trauma from those early years would be an understatement. And as you alluded to, you really dedicated your life now to becoming a beacon of light. Kind of take me through that process, right? From seeing the darkness, from being at rock bottom, perhaps as a young person, then coming back to this path that you're on now. How did that transformation take shape for you? Oh, gosh. Uh, let me try to answer that question in less than nine hours. <laughs> Uh, you know, it was a lifetime and I'm, I'm an old lady now. And so it's taken uh, many trips around the sun to figure it out. But I would say that probably the, the most significant thing for me was that I started out with um, uh, no self-worth, okay. self-esteem, just like non-existent. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, when you're when you're given away, when you're le I was left with someone um, and, and my parents didn't come back. And so it's it's sort of feels like being thrown out with the trash mm. and so then you you know it's hard not to carry that feeling with you into the rest of your life so i felt like uh that i was an accident of biology right and the best thing that could possibly happen is if i just keep my head down and don't make any trouble try not to use too much air try not to use too much space right i didn't think i deserved the food that i ate i mean it was just a it was um it's hard to even really express and i think i have a fairly robust vocabulary i've written 15 books but it's hard to express um wounds that happened when before you had language right, right? so a lot of this stuff is sort of um i guess what they call primal wounds where we know that it's there and we can feel it but it's very mm -hmm. difficult to express it and communicate it effectively. What changed that for me was actually when I began to work and, and I would do all kinds of things, you know, from the time I was a little bitty kid, um, I would um, offer to pick fruit off of trees in the neighborhood that were overflowing with fruit. And then I would stuff them into bags and then I would go door to door and sell the fruit <laughs> to try to get money to buy some food to eat. Um, but my first real job when I was 15 uh, changed everything for me mm. because when I got those paychecks, Michael, every paycheck, every earned paycheck made me feel like I had done something, like I actually had some value, like I was able to contribute something good in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so with every paycheck, I felt better and better and better. And so that was one thing. I took that work ethic mm -hmm. and that I had a tremendous sense of responsibility um, 
and faithfulness toward employers who gave me that opportunity to earn right. those paychecks, right? So I took all of that and I found the intersection between work ethic, responsibility, all of those kinds of things, wanting to do well, wanting to hear somebody say, well done, you did great. Um, and I found the intersection between that and what I cared passionately about, which was preventing child abuse. Yeah. And that's where I started my first business when I was 27 years old. It was the only insurance organization in the United States founded solely to protect and defend the good people and organizations that take care of abused kids mm -hmm. and fragile families. And because I was so passionate about children who have been abused and so um, committed, I mean, and committed is really not even a strong enough word. I was completely compelled. absorbed. Yeah, compelled. compelled is good, right? Uh, I mean, I was working 80 to 100 hours a week. I was so involved in this mm -hmm. and it gave me such a sense of satisfaction to know that what I was so passionate about was valuable to mm -hmm. other people and that I could earn a living doing what I loved doing. I mean, it was amazing. Wow. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna segue off of that because there's such a contrast, right, to where you were to where you are in so many ways. And, you know, money is one of those ways. You are now a self-made millionaire. And, it, you know, to hear you kind of describe those first couple of paychecks, you know, with that first job, and it sounds to me like, you know, you you were able to surface so much gratitude and thankfulness and almost leverage those, not because of the amount of the paychecks, but just as momentum to work off of, right? As sort of like a starting place, as an engine. Talk to me about money for a minute and what money is to you now, and more importantly, how you are using it in the world to propel your mission forward. How, what's your relationship to money like today? I've heard this so many times where I hear people say, money is the root of all evil. And I think, well, the, you know, the electric company wants to get paid every month. And, and, you know, when I go to the grocery store, they don't just let me walk out with that cart full of groceries. I mean, it's a tool. Money is a tool yes. and it's necessary in this life. And as long as we earn money and we have it honorably and uh, you know, we've done something good to receive it. Uh, I mean, the, Jesus himself said the laborers earn their wage. And so there's nothing wrong with earning money. Mm -hmm. I think the distinction is, and you asked me about my relationship to money. I see it as a tool. I see it as an amazing way to do good in the world. For example, I could pay for somebody's education and change the trajectory of their life with money. If I don't have money, I can pray for somebody, I can help them, I can share my lunch with them. I, can, I mean, there are other things, that, other ways that I can show love. Yes. One of the books I wrote was 30 Days to Love. It's ways to show love. Another one of my books is uh, 101 uh, Acts of Kindness. There are lots of ways that we can show love. But when we have income or the, the kind of uh, wealth, I should say, that allows us to move beyond just survival and to use it as a tool to change lives, you know, then then it gets fun. Right. And and so I think it's it's there's nothing wrong with having money as long as money doesn't have you. Mm. I love that. That's the way I look at it. That's and money amazing. doesn't have me, but I have it. And I, and I'm glad I have it because I've lived without money. Yep. I've gone hungry for days on end. And I can tell you that it's infinitely better to have it than not have it. <laughs> right. right, right, right. Yeah. I think a lot of people can relate to that in, in their own way for sure. Um, and there's so many things that can be a source of challenge and anxiety and despair. And of course it's about overcoming those roadblocks and the person that we become through that journey. But whether it's the economy and the current financial situation on the globe right now or something else, what do you think people are struggling with most today? Like, what are you seeing or hearing with those that you serve that is troubling them mentally or emotionally? Is there anything that is top of mind? 
Oh gosh, Michael, <laughs> you ask such good questions. I could think about 4,200 answers to that. The first one that I think of is um, division. Mm -hmm. Again, I have to go back to my Christian faith. One of the last recorded prayers of Jesus was that we be unified. And so we're so divided right now. It's, I, I, I don't like it. I don't divvy people up into groups of, you know, based on their, the color of their skin or their level of education or who they, who they want to uh, live life with or socioeconomic status, or I don't do that. Right. And I don't like that. Right. And the, the divvying up into small groups to me is so incredibly painful because it often, it, it, it leads to people feeling like the outsider. So any group that's established, somebody's not in it, right? Mm -hmm. So, so who's ever left out is now the them of between the us and them. How's that person feel? Less than, not good enough. I've felt like that and I don't like that. And I don't want anybody to have to feel like that. So that's the one thing. The other thing, all of that, the feeling less than and uh, social isolation, all of that yeah. leads to unhappiness, sadness, depression, despair. The suicide rate, I mean, it's ridiculously off the chart. Yeah. And substance abuse, you know, the way people self-medicate, and, and it's not only with drugs and alcohol, it's it's um, shopping too much, eating a gallon of ice cream, porn, you name it. Whatever we use to medicate our pain or distract us from our pain right. is not good. Right, right. And you and I, I think, both know that the solution to all of this is living our purpose because there is a good purpose for each of us. It's an individualized good purpose for which we were specifically matched. Mm. We have the skills, the talents, the abilities, the intelligences, yes, plural, intelligences, the perspective, um, the worldview, the values, the belief system. I could go on and on and on. All of that, each of us has a unique combination of all of those things and that unique combination is perfectly matched to something and when we find our thing we are genius at it mm. we're amazing at it and then it no longer matters whatever we're not good at i couldn't agree with you more couldn't agree more can we talk about purpose for a moment because i know this is your primary focus these days helping people to avail and live into their purpose um, I read something really interesting a couple of years ago, and it stuck with me around this, this topic. And that is that your purpose is iterative. It's almost like an onion that you get to peel back, you, you know, and to, to go layer by layer, piece by piece. But each layer is in and of itself sort of like a mini purpose because it's constantly being revealed and reformulated as you get closer to the core. And that really changed my perspective for a bit where I felt like I needed to know my purpose right now. And if I wasn't doing it, then I was missing out or losing in life. And that's just not true. And so you don't need to know your core. You don't need to know what's at the core right now to get started. You just have to do what you're most, what feels most intimate and important for you in the present moment. And you can't help but become more purposeful in that pursuit. So kind of a two part prompt for you around that. Number one, do you have any perspective on on that idea and then part two what are some strategies or i guess signposts that people should look for when trying to figure out something as grandiose but maybe as simple as their purpose Ooh, okay oh you're so good at this what a great question so um the way i look at it that sort of makes sense for me is that i love how you said uh that you know the layers are like a mini purpose the way i look at it is okay there's there's a good purpose for our lives okay but there within the purpose are different plans different life assignments if you will right for different seasons of our lives right. so for example if somebody's listening right now and they just found out she just found out she's pregnant well didn't that just change everything right? So becoming a mom, becoming a dad. Okay. So there's, that's a season in life 
it's it's finite. I mean, yes, you're always a parent. Um, I mean, when I'm 90, uh, my my daughter will then be 70 and she will still be my baby girl when she's 70 years old, right? And when I'm 90, right? So it is a lifetime thing. But from the standpoint of your whole life evolving around this other little human, that's really a finite time of life, right? So yeah. that's an assignment. Yeah. That's a plan. Right. And the plans all weave together to become the overall purpose. Mm -hmm. So my example of that would be, since I'm old, uh, I've had different life assignments. And I see now in hindsight that uh, all of the life assignments have, have just woven together to become this beautiful fabric that's now my life. And the one I gave you before about my company, when I started my company, when I was 27, I thought I would do that forever. Yeah. I couldn't imagine that there would be any other purpose for my life other than helping to manage the risk in child welfare organizations and keep children safe. And it turns out there was, a, there was more, mm -hmm. there was more for me. And, and God had another step of the plan for me. Now, I had my free will. I could stay with the original plan and I could do that for the rest of my life. But I, I say all the time, finding and living the good plans for our lives often has to do, I think, with paying attention to opportunities that are presented, paying attention to our feeling of peace, or uneasiness about something, um, paying attention to feelings of discontent or of truly being miserable. You know, if somebody's listening and they're just, they just hate their job and they hate their life and they're completely miserable. Well, that to me, that's bells going off and neon flashing lights going off that would tell you that you're probably not in the sweet middle of your purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, because our when we're really living our purpose, we we, we have a sense of, peace and joy, good relationships, healthy relationships with good people, a sense of wellness and contentedness and enough financial provision to do what we were really created and born to do. Mm. That doesn't mean everything's easy though, all the time. I have to quickly add, there are times when you are right smack in the middle of your purpose and you have a hard thing. Yes. You can lose somebody you love, I mean, st life happens. We live in a broken world. Things can happen. But when those things happen, the important thing is going full circle back to the way we started this conversation, Michael, is we have to mine the lessons out of those hard things exactly. and say, okay, what is this situation teaching me? What is it? What can I learn from this? And the way I look at it is the sooner we learn the lesson, the sooner we get to finish with that, you know, with that class. And some of these things that are really hard, where we're really suffering, I don't want to take that test again. I want to learn the lesson the first time because uh, God in his infinite love for us will go ahead and make arrangements for us to, you know, run right through a difficult thing again, if we fail to get it the first time. So, um, Yes. I don't know if that really answered your question. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think like trust and faith and being able to kind of presence yourself in the midst of, of a lot of the those periods of upheaval is something that is so important, but it like it's not easy, right? When when everything around you is so chaotic and hectic and life seems unfair and confusing and why why is this wrench this wrench being thrown into this this journey that I was doing so well along? Well, it's meant to be a mountain to be overcome right it, and in that overcoming that's that's the true purpose that's where we really solidify i think the learnings and the the lessons and the skills that you know we've we've been working to perfect it's like the test and um um that's where the real magic happens if you can summon the courage to face it so i love that Ooh, that's a really good way to put that summon the courage to face it Right. I think some of the most important lessons that we can learn in this life, some of the mo most profound things that truly can change our lives and, and turn us directly into the path of our purpose mm -hmm. are the hard things, are the sufferings that yeah. we would do anything to avoid. Yeah.
<laughs> I wrote a blog about this just recently that when you when I've gone back and thought about the things that I would have really done anything to avoid, those things turned out to be once I got on the other side of them turned out to be some of the most significant things uh, from the standpoint of the lessons, right. the wisdom that came out of it, the relationships that came out of it. Mm -hmm. And and a, a quick example is just I, I had saved, I had saved forever because I wanted to actually have an insurance company, not just an insurance brokerage or program administrator. I wanted to be a risk bearer. So I saved my money forever and I, and I entered into an arrangement to have my own insurance company. And this was going to do amazing good for child welfare organizations all over the United States where I was going to be able to put millions of dollars back into their budgets. Nine months in, planes hit the World Trade Center and my company was located in World Trade II. So at 42 years old, I stood in front of the television and watched this horrific thing. I mean, the loss of life, obviously, the most, the most important thing. But on top of that, for me, I was watching my dream just disintegrate in front of my eyes. Mm -hmm. all of that money gone, um, everything that I had worked for gone. Mm -hmm. And it's at those points in our lives where we go, oh, wait a minute. Um, hello. Did I just, did I miss something? Right. Did I think this was my purpose? I mean, I, I thought that was my purpose. And that like, did I not hear, did I not get the memo that that wasn't my purpose? Mm -hmm. Where did I go off the path? And so, you know, I had a lot of those conversations with God going, okay, uh, I had a 40 year career in yeah. insurance. Um, and that wasn't the end of it. I, you know, I rebuilt and, and whatever, but the bottom line of it was that from that situation, I wound up really with my eyes opened to the fact that there was a whole world out there that I hadn't even considered because I was so myopically focused on what I thought was my purpose. Sure. It was around that time that I thought that I, that a friend of mine asked me to speak to her 17 year old foster daughter who was making bad decisions at a hundred miles an hour. And I said, no, I'm not going to talk to her because she will not listen to me, but I'm going to write to her. I'm going to write her a letter and then she can read it and she can wad it up in a ball and she can throw it in a corner. But maybe one day she'll pick it back up and smooth it out and she'll actually read it. Well, I wrote that letter. That was, it became my first book. And because I'm not a mental health professional and I was afraid I might say the wrong thing, I, I printed up a few copies and I handed it out to my friends who are social workers and psychologists and different ones. And I, and I just said, would you just read this just to make sure that I don't say anything I shouldn't say, or that could cause more harm than good. Well, one of them thought it was so good that she sent it to the buyer for Barnes and Noble in New York. And I mean, I went to like Kinko's or something. I mean, I just, <laughs> it didn't look great. It wasn't a book. I mean, it was a lot. I had a lot to say, but, uh, the lady at Barnes and Noble called out of the clear blue. And I actually thought that it was a joke. I thought one of my friends was playing a joke on me because I didn't know anybody had sent it in. Mm -hmm. And she said, if you'll make these changes and I actually turn it into a book. Yeah. And um, if you'll do this, 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 and I'm frantically grabbing a paper and a pen. Cause I thought I wait, I think this lady's giving me advice that I cannot pay for. It's priceless. Let me write down everything she's saying because she said, I won't tell you the words that she used. It's probably not appropriate on your podcast, but it was something like, you know, this is crap. <laughs> not good. She didn't say that it was worse. Uh, but she says, if you'll make these changes, I'm going to make sure that this is in every single Barnes and Noble in the United States. And she did. And then, and then the today show called and then other media outlets called my point in sharing that whole story, Michael, is to say here, here I'm going firmly down a path that I think it's my purpose and I'm working hard and I'm being honest and I'm showing up and I do more than expected. And I did all the things that I knew um, helped you 
be successful in business. And despite all that, my business was nearly destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue to help out a friend <laughs> and her and her uh, daughter who, be, who became her daughter, all of a sudden, it's like this whole other thing opened up. I'm not a writer. I don't know. I didn't go to school to learn how to do any of that stuff. I, I've never known how to do any of this stuff that I've done. But my point is there... The, that first thing that was 40 years that I thought it was a lifetime of purpose. Right. It was a plan. Yes. It was and a life assignment. It wasn't the whole thing. And a small opening, right? From like a destructive situation, just a small sliver of light, right? That was completely unexpected. And sometimes that's where the most amazing opportunities stem from. And that's the only place they can come from. Otherwise, we wouldn't be receptive. We wouldn't even see them as you. As you Absolutely. It, that's a great point because had everything progressed the way I planned for it to, yeah. I would have been working 100 hours a week. I would have said to my girlfriend, oh, man, I'd love to help you. But there's no I can't. I, yeah. you know, I'm like getting five hours of sleep at the most. There's no possible way. So I had the time when she asked that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Right. And now I've written 15 books and now I've, you know, done all these other things. There are so many doors that have opened up as a result of making that whole transition, wow. selling my company and, and walking forward into something that so was so incredibly unknown to me mm -hmm. it felt like stepping off of a cliff mm -hmm. and have no idea how far of a fall it would be mm -hmm. and it's been an amazing journey and and the journey continues there's so many different pockets that i would love to jump into from that story um and maybe we can have a part two to this conversation at some point because i know there's more depth there but where I want to kind of end this conversation is just around the idea of productivity. Um, if there's any strategies or tips that you have for maximizing your time and your energy for, for impact, because as you alluded to, you're, you're a busy woman. You have so much going on between the books, the courses. I know you have a blog and your own podcast. Um, and I know that can be challenging for a lot of coaches and creators like ourselves um, to find the time and, and more than that, I think just energy allocation, right? What, what are the right things to be working on? So do you have any learnings that you can share as you've kind of built your clout in the marketplace around that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So um, I'm a naturally disorganized person. I'm a popcorn thinker. <laughs> I have 450 new ideas every 10 seconds. And so it's, um, I had to learn compensatory skills for keeping the thing, the thing and yes. keeping myself focused on my purpose and not getting distracted by every shiny thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, that meant writing down the night before the top three things or the top five things or whatever it was that I absolutely had to get done the next day. Right. And then I would do those things first before I did anything else. Okay. That was me as the CEO of my company, large and in charge and making, making sure everybody did that. What I would say now is slightly different because I'm in a different season. So, um, I always would start my day with prayer before, but now I have more time to really sit and not only uh, sort of say a quick prayer while I'm going 65 miles an hour on the way to whatever, but now I won't leave the house until after I've prayed, not only prayed, but then listen. Mm -hmm. So not just rushing to the next thing, blurting out a prayer, because think about it. If I see you in the morning and I don't, if I just say, Hey, Michael, hope you have a great day. And I don't stop and really listen to you. I'm not going to hear you say, Rhonda, don't take the 10 freeway. It's close, <laughs> right? I, will, I mean, or you might say, I'm really hurting. I really need something right now. So 
it's so important for me. I pray, I listen, and I and I really pay attention to what happens next. And I don't get a loud booming voice from heaven. I wish that I would. I wish that I would get an email with bullet points that said do that and that, like all prioritized. No, that's not what happens. But I will get an idea that says, um, hey, respond to that email from Michael Becker. Or call this one or send that one a text. Yeah. And sometimes those little promptings wind up opening doors that I couldn't have forced open with a sledgehammer. And so I just say, pray, listen, act, because you have to act, right? If you get some kind of a prompting in your mind to text so-and-so or email Michael Becker, and then I don't do it. Well, it's my own fault that -hmm. the good thing that could have happened is not going to happen now. Uh, and then, and then repeat. So pray, listen, act, repeat. That's my advice. Yeah, I love it. And also, I mean, just to put a cap on that too, what I'm hearing is, you know, make time to come out of the linear day-to-day mechanical work so that you can hear and receive what you call prompts. I call them downloads, um, (laughs) right? It's like little, little spurts of insight, um, that we, again, we wouldn't be receptive to them if, if, if we're too hyper-focused on, on the stuff you know, the stuff of the day, the doing, um, the action, which is also equally important, but it's almost like creating the space to be aligned, to do the right actions, to be directionally, directionally accurate is, is so important. It is. It absolutely is. Because in this, um, time that we live in with all the things that can distract us, yeah. there might be I don't know, 700,000 really great things that you can do today. Totally. There's one thing that only you can do. So when we think about the things that are perfectly matched to our skill set, it's what we can do. That gives us a laser focus toward the, the micro pieces of the life assignment that when lived day to day to day to day, walk us right into the sweet middle of the purpose for which we were born and perfectly matched. Rhonda, thank you so much for this conversation.